Hello, a very warm welcome to today's show. This is chapter one of the Bhagavad Gita and we're looking at the subject of the despondency of Arjuna. This is the first episode that we'll be taking up which is the uh, part one of the entire series of the Bhagavad Gita and we will be looking at all 18 chapters. Uh, Sister Denise, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who are at home and joining us for the first time, I strongly recommend that you watch this series in a sequential order so that you can follow Sister Denise's sharings on each and every chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. So, Sister Denise, um, Arjuna first calls God Lord of the Earth. Then he calls him the imperishable one. Is there any significance to the use of these two titles? Um, I know that God has hundreds of titles in the various religions. Uh, what is the significance of these two particular titles at the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita? By seeing these titles, we can see that we're not talking about a human person or a prophet soul, something like this. But Lord of the world is a reference to the being who is the Lord over the whole world. That means it's clearly a reference to the Supreme Being. And so we're still looking at the question of who exactly is the sermonizer of the Gita? Who is speaking the Gita? And uh, when you see the word Lord of the world, that means it's the Lord for all the people in the world, not just only the geography of the planet, but also the sociology of the planet, all the different groups of people. Uh, may I interject? You spoke of the question as to who is the sermonizer of the Gita. Can the answer to that question be found in the Gita or do you look for it outside the Gita? Well, I think you have to look at it inside the Gita, but it's a matter of interpretation because all the different titles that are given for God, like Lord of the World, like the Imperishable One. You see, anyone who's a mortal, a human being with a human body, is perishable. And when you take up the word the Imperishable One, that means you're referring to the Spirit. So here you can see that Arjuna is referring not to the incarnate form of Krishna that would be depicted in the way that we normally associate with the form of Krishna, but the spirit which is in that form. And so the Lord of the world means the Supreme Being, the imperishable one refers to that spirit, you see. So already we're moving into the realm of the discarnate. We're moving into the realm of incorporeal supreme God who can communicate with humans. My next question is that the reader is invited to consider the following, that God and a human being meet face to face. Yeah. Uh, this is an extraordinary concept. Um, how does this play out? And uh, my question for you is, does this happen in reality? I believe that every soul on earth must ultimately have an encounter with God. Because the encounter between an imperishable soul and the imperishable supreme soul is the thing that brings the soul back to his, her original condition. So this brings up another question, and that is about a soul. And you'll see in the Gita, it's a little bit ambivalent because in some parts of it, it speaks very clearly that the soul becomes God. In other places, you will see that it's not possible for a soul to become God. A soul is always a soul, God is always God, and there is a relationship between the two. But the idea of the soul and God meeting face to face is really extraordinary because it is the desire of souls to meet God. You know, in Hinduism, for example, the word bhakti 
refers to love for God. And it's all the different practices and tapasyas and rituals and so many practices that people do in order to meet God. And generally speaking, what people are looking for is a vision of God. So if you have a vision of somebody or if you have the person themselves, the vision is actually one removed. So you want to actually meet with God direct, but that's very difficult because you are in the consciousness of being a human being in a human body on the material earth, in material consciousness, God is on a completely different level. And so you can't meet. It's not possible. One has to go on to the same level as God, or God has to come on to the same level of you. And so this is where there is this whole question of an incarnation or an avatar of God, you see. So there are beliefs that God will take a form and through that form we'll meet. So that is also there. And, and the form of Krishna is traditionally considered one of the avatars of God. Vishnu, the form of Vishnu is another one. And as very often said, Krishna, Vishnu is the same. Some people, they say there are many incarnations of God, in which case it will be said Buddha is considered one of the incarnations of God, Ram is considered one of the incarnations of God. And then when you move to some of the other religious traditions, it will be said that um, you know Jesus Christ is the incarnation of God. Like this, you, you will get the... Um, awareness within the tradition that the founder of the religion is a incarnation of God. And then that makes it very difficult to know why would God create so many religions? Does God create this many religions? Um, how does that all work? You know, so in the Gita you've got a lot of statements that you can work with to try to find a resolution to that question. So, Sister Denise, basically your answer is yes, there is a point when the human yes. soul and God meet face to face. But, there are a lot of buts in that. Sister Denise, in Chapter 1, uh, Arjuna notes that uh, the two armies have come together in war against Duryodhana, uh, who I believe is the evil-minded son of Dhritara Dhritarashtra. Okay, pardon my pronunciation. Arjuna sees all his kinsmen and family members all arrayed, okay? And it is at this point he sinks into a despondency because he realizes that he's got to kill them. This is his pain, okay? And uh, stanza after stanza, we hear him express the extent of his pain and torment to Krishna. And page 29 of the translation that I have reads, My limbs sink down, my mouth dries up, my body trembles, and my hair stands on end. Uh, this graphically depicts his pain. Um, I think at this stage, the reader um, sympathizes with uh, this um, moral human being who is fortunate enough to have God in front of him face to face, who is experiencing all of this pain. Well, it's a very difficult situation because there's a, a ethical conflict mm. and it's not possible to resolve it. On the one hand, anyway, he's a peace-loving person. He doesn't want to go to war, but he has to go to war because of the demands of the circumstances. Then on top of that, the people he has to go to war with are his family members. So on two levels, he is going against dharma in order to fulfill dharma. So the contradiction is what's giving him the torment, you see, because it's, it's not possible to resolve it. Mm. And here you have Krishna saying, you know, as God saying, this is a real situation and I'm telling you that what you have to do is to destroy these people. And then he goes on later in the chapter to explain why it's ethical to do that. Mm. Uh, his uh, use of language is very descriptive. Uh, he says, um, 
page 35, I do not desire to kill them who are bent on killing. Uh, later it is said on page 38 or further that uh, he saw evil and was quite happy to turn his back on evil. That is his way of dealing with evil. Well, isn't that the case for so many of us? We just turn our back on it and hope it'll go away, but it doesn't. So uh, what is the message here? That <coughs> when you encounter evil, you do what? When you encounter evil, you have to face it. You have to destroy it. But evil itself and your relatives are not the same thing. So he sees his relative, and within his relative he sees evil. But nevertheless, evil itself is not the same thing as the person. So you have two things, but one of them is inside the other one, which makes it very difficult. And if you say, well, um, I, because you have a paradox, and you have to deal with the paradox. And the Bhagavad Gita is full of them, isn't it? Full of it, yeah. yes. And, and I think spirituality is all about dealing with these impossible, irreconcilable paradoxes. And, and I think that the sign of a spiritually enlightened person is that they can work with paradox and resolve them. So here... Oh wait, hold on Denise, that is very powerful. Say that again. A sign of? The sign of a spiritually enlightened person is they're able to work with paradox and resolve the paradox, you see. Uh, because a regular person, it's either this or this. You can't be both and. Mm. You know, like the idea of destiny. It's either destined or you have free will. Mm. But in the Gita, it's all merged together. And you have to work with the paradox of destiny and freedom. And this is why it's so tormenting for, for Arjuna, because he is the embodiment of the principles of righteousness. Krishna, as God, is um, explaining to him otherwise. And God, anyway, will tell the truth. And the truth of God is in opposition to the truth that has been determined by tradition. And this is where you have a very difficult conflict to resolve. Uh, Sister Denise, um, page 46, um, Arjuna goes so far as to say that he's prepared to die rather than kill. It, it is that intense. You said in an earlier episode that Arjuna represents the a man of conscience, a man who's morally um, stable and mm -hmm. sound. And if you look at uh, average, well, good person in inverted commas, many in the world believe that they cannot kill and wouldn't want to. Mm -hmm. But the question is, kill what? They're faced with the scenario where your very life is threatened by evil and so how do you manage that but Arjuna is in the position where he says I would rather die the last verse in chapter 1 sees our hero literally throw down his bow and arrow and figuratively slash literally fall into his knees in a sign of um, total dejection dejection but also he's immediately accused of cowardice <laughs> yeah you see, and Krishna doesn't accept this, mm. you see. So in other words, there is no way out. Mm. And just avoiding the problem is no way out. Many is, of us. Sorry, is that what Arjuna is doing? He sees evil and he says, I'm not touching this. Well, he sees evil. He knows he has to destroy evil because of it being evil. But then he says, the thing in which the evil is, is my relative. So then he starts to not see the evil because it's inside and he sees the surface which is the relative and then he's responding to his sense perception, his eye sees the relative and, and no feelings. longer sees the evil. And his feelings. His really? feelings, he has attachment. Yes, I mean you care about your relatives, of they're course. your relatives. And even if his relatives are doing very bad things, 
that's secondary to the fact that he, they're his relatives, you see, in his hierarchy of moral principles. Who is Arjuna's enemy? What is Arjuna's enemy? I think we'll have to say that his enemy is his perception. <laughs> Yo, that's a, you know, grab onto my chair. Uh, <laughs> hold, hold on tightly, answer. His problem is not on the outside, his problem is on the inside. Here you have a spiritual being, the soul of Arjuna, in the body of Arjuna, talking to the spirit of God, who is clothed in, you know, the word Krishna means the most attractive one. And so God is in a very attractive form. You'll see later on in the Gita, he wants to see God in his multi-dimensional form, which is then too scary. He says, no, I, I, I like the um, attractive form because then me and God, we're friends. And then it's a situation of uh, anthropomorphization of God, in which he makes God into a human like himself. And there's other parts a little later in the God when he realizes how limited it is to do that. So his problem at every step is he's limited by sense perception. When he sees Krishna as Krishna the man, he's limited by seeing something that looks like a human being who he can make as his friend. When he's seeing Duryodhan, he's seeing his relative visual perception. And you see, what the Gita is all about is the whole question of blood connection. You see, because blood, a blood relative you can't kill is dishonorable. You can kill somebody who's other. And, and the problem with this war is, it's, well, it's civil war, but even deeper than that, it's a family feud. And so the blood connection between them demands that you have to honor that and then the behavior demands a different thing and the two demands are absolutely incompatible so this is tormenting for Arjuna because he cannot resolve this and the problem is that he's perceiving the human form and he's not perceiving the spirit that is contained within the form. What comes to mind is that uh, from the moment we meet Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, we know that he is a warrior. Uh, but when he throws down his bow and arrow, he's an unarmed warrior in a battlefield. Uh, he's putting himself into an increasingly dangerous position um, because of the way he feels. And Sister Denise, he not only feels um, pain and torment, he feels an extreme amount of fear. Fear for himself and fear for the people that he loves. That's what he's accused of. He's accused of fear, but I don't think he's afraid. What do you think he feels? I, I think he feels that he cannot resolve the situation and what many of us will do, will, somebody else has to solve my problem. Because I cannot solve my own problem. You go to a higher authority, mm. you see. And so he says, Krishna, your God, you figure it out. And Krishna says, excuse me, you figure it out. Okay. You can't get away with that as childishness. It is hard for Arjuna to hear that, is it not? Well... It's, it's very strong medicine. Yeah, the Gita is very strong medicine. The Bhagavad Gita is a song. It's um, a magic flute, it's knowledge, and it's medicine. Uh, I hope you're taking note of this at home. It's medicine. I've never thought of the Bhagavad Gita as medicine. Because it's so difficult to swallow. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> that's quite funny. <laughs> okay, so Sister Denise, um, how are we able to take what is written in Chapter 1, or contained in Chapter 1, and um, apply it to the person that you are right now. When I read the Bhagavad Gita, after I read chapter one, I thought this Arjuna seems like a really n nice guy. And um, uh, I have full sympathy with everything that he's feeling. 
and uh, it's very cleverly written because the moment you meet Arjuna you you identify with him because he represents who you are. I Absolutely. mean if you faced when you're about to be annihilated uh, you uh, the average person an ordinary person whatever that means nowadays will be frozen in fear uh, but will not reach for uh, a weapon themselves to kill their, their perpetrator of the intended crime. You just look the person whilst you being killed. Uh, so one can easily identify with this um, Arjuna whose character is presented to the reader from day one as being somebody of noble bearing. Yeah, and a warrior must be fearless, otherwise you're not a warrior. Uh, and if you're going to kill somebody who's looking at you, it's more difficult to kill them because they're looking at you. Ooh. Usually, uh, the killers want their victims to be in a state of extreme terror and looking away. And if they're sitting calmly looking at them, it's difficult to pull that trigger. What should we learn from Arjuna's plight? This is before God delivers an answer. Yes. I think what we need to do with chapter one is realize that uh, a lot of us have a, a lot of arrogance. What, uh, sorry to interject, what type of arrogance? Well, you see, Arjuna is thrown down his weapons. He's a warrior. That's not what you do. And so the arrogant person will say, oh, he's a wimp. We, you can answer this question more expansively in episodes to come, but what are Arjuna's weapons? What is his bow and what is his arrow? Well, that's an interesting aspect of the symbolism uh, because the, um, the arrows he's, he's are... An, sorry, he's an archer. Yes. Is he not? Yes. And um, you, you see the uh, training of Arjuna you know, and, and Arjuna is the only one who has that total concentration that in his um, training that you see in the Mahabharat, release your arrow when Arjuna says, I cannot see anything except the eye of the bird. And then the arrow goes straight to the eye. And so that means Arjuna has absolutely total concentration, which is perfect for a warrior. He's a hero. He's the number one, the best, and yet he's a child in the face of this tremendous dilemma. He just doesn't have what it takes to resolve that. And the arrogant person is also a child and so has to be challenged. What do you mean here, you know? Uh, because you see, Arjun is the compassionate one, the one who's concerned to do everything right. Mm. The man is concerned with the destruction of family, lawlessness reigning, uh, women being corrupted, etc. He is uh, an extremely concerned citizen. Absolutely. <laughs> and so there are anybody who really is concerned about the state of the world, the state of society, etc., is motivated to do something and Arjun is clearly in a, a situation where all of his feelings, all of his perceptions of the state of the world uh, force him to act, you know. But every time he takes a step of action, he encounters something which makes him want to not act, because if he acts, he goes against his principles. And if he doesn't act, he also goes against his principles, but different ones. Okay, so uh, our principles itself can become our enemy. Yes. Well, our principles themselves don't become our enemy, but when you look at the principles you have in the context of a real situation, then you realize that the real situations and the um, theoretical principles cannot work together. Mm. And this is a really big problem of the world today because if anybody is a person of principle, they come into a real situation, they get caught up in all varieties of compromise, 
you see, and then they have to start going against their principles, the principles are untenable, and then and, and it gets more and more and more difficult. And this is why people tend to say, it's too hard, somebody else can figure it out for me. I, I'm looking for an external moral authority. And the ultimate external moral authority is, of course, God. Mm. But then God will tell you to do something that you'll argue with, <laughs> you see. And you'll say, look, God, uh, we can't do that because it's immoral. And God will say, well, you know what, I'm God, so <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> and okay. it's difficult. Yes. Okay, Sister Denise, so is Arjuna's problem that he cannot kill anyone, who he, or is it that he cannot kill something? Someone or something? It's not even quite as simple as that. His problem is he can't kill someone who's a blood relative. Okay. But he has to because that one has become the embodiment of evil. This is what the dilemma is. He can't and he must at the same time. So he says, I won't do it okay. upon seeing the blood relative. He's not able to see that the pure evil has to be destroyed because he sees the chariot or the form in which the evil is manifest. Mm. Okay, unfortunately we have to stop right there uh, and uh, I don't know about you but I'm waiting in breathless anticipation to see what Sister Denise has to share on the next episode. So there you have it. Uh, I take it that those of you who are listening to this episode have some knowledge of the Bhagavad Gita. If you don't, I recommend that you do. Um, Sister Denise has shared in this episode uh, how she interprets the um, various stanzas to understand the extent of Arjuna's pain. And um, when you're reading this, um, I recommend that you look into the mirror of your heart and ask yourself, uh, do you identify with Arjuna in any way? And if you were in a situation that he is, in other words, if you faced evil, if you encountered evil face to face, what would you do? I think this is the question that Sister Denise has um, brought to light in this episode. How do you deal with the evil in your life? This is not a historical question. This is a question that's facing you today in your life. So we'll end here. Uh, and I would ask you to join us for the next episode when we find an answer to this extremely uh, deep, fascinating and relevant question for the 21st century. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sister Denise, and goodbye. <laughs>